Well, y'all know our next speaker is our incoming president, Ricky Lennox. He's our president-elect. And uh, Ricky is a wildlife biologist, recently retired from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, where he worked for um, 38.5 years. Over the last 18 years, Ricky served 52 counties in North Central Texas. Ricky is the author of Rangeland Plants of North Central Texas, a land user's guide to their identification, value, and management. His assistance to, assistance to landowners and managers involves mutual education on how to better management, manage rangelands for sustainable use by livestock and wildlife. Knowing the plants and know how to manage them is critical for success in a land steward. So if y'all will welcome Ricky Lennox, please. Several of you in here are probably old enough to remember Ernest Tubb had a hit single called Waltz Across Texas. And we're gonna take a creek waltz, waltz across Texas. All right, we're gonna look uh, again, the vegetational areas of Texas. These get introduced, they've already been introduced once. Um, this one is a neat map because it also has the rivers, the major rivers of Texas. And if I put the major urban areas, several of them intersect with these rivers. And this causes some issues quite a bit with excessive erosion, things like that. But we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some creeks from all vegetational regions of Texas, except for the high plains. I don't have any from it. Uh, we're gonna look at distribution maps of each of these plants and the distribution maps come from the Biota of North America program, Bone App. If you go on there right here in the middle, um, look where it says US county level species maps, that right there. This is where I'm getting the county definition, uh, county uh, maps. You can go online and find, uh, read about proper functioning condition of a riparian area. And the definition is a properly functioning riparian area will have adequate vegetation, landform, such as large rocks, boulders, or large logs, buried logs, to dissipate the energy of floodwaters, slow it down. When you slow the floodwaters down, um, you can reduce erosion. We're not trying to eliminate it. Erosion is natural. We can stabilize the banks with the vegetation and or the landform. We can trap the sediment that's in the water. The sediment helps to enlarge the floodplain. So it, it gives us more water storage capacity and water flood water retention. And we have groundwater recharge into the aquifers and providing long-term storage in the banks and floodplains. This is what keeps the creeks flowing, is that underground water that is connected to the creek. So I'm gonna show you the definition again, just the first part of it, but in this one photo of a Texas Creek, we can see adequate vegetation and the landform that it mentions in that definition as protecting the creeks. And we also have a lot of creeks with large logs. If the Creek, creek needs large logs, they're usually there. So we gotta, gotta maintain them. If you wanna dive off more into riparian management, there are uh, eight riparian workshops held every year. The Texas, uh, Texas Water Resources Institute is who actually puts them on. They're, they're part of A&M. They're advertised on the Texas Riparian Association website. And you can find it, texasriparian.org. The first workshop in the spring, there'll be four in the spring, between now and June, four in the fall. First one's gonna be in Bryan on March the 7th. Uh, we're gonna tour Carter's Creek. And these are all creeks that have some degraded um, problems. So let's begin our creek walks across Texas. And if you walk these riparian areas, you'll see some trees. Trees, big trees, such as this one, uh, that get washed down in flood waters. That's natural. It happens. These get incorporated back into the creek, and it's, it's just a natural process. I want to show you a creek on the northwest side of the Metroplex. We talked about the vegetational areas and the rivers and the intersection with the cities. This is the west fork of the Trinity River in Jack County, southeast of Jacksboro. Look at the vegetation that's here. Um, as you go 
forward across the Metroplex, the East Park of the Trinity and several others join in. And southeast of Dallas, this is what the full Trinity River looks like. Quite a bit of erosion, but it has also had to absorb quite a bit of water from concrete, asphalt, other impervious surfaces that doesn't soak in. And this creek, even though it looks pretty nasty, it's doing what a creek does. A creek transports water and sediment. The water is coming down the creek, and then the sediment, it will pick up sediment either from runoff, or it picks it up out of the channel of the creek, or it picks the sediment up off the banks. Like you see on the outside bend of a creek, that's the cut bank. That's where the highest eroded or highest velocity water hits that bank and creates the erosion. On the right hand side, we have a point bar or a sandbar, gravel bar. The sediment that's cut right here is carried downstream and then deposited on the inside bend of the next bend. And that's what forms these point bars. So erosion is natural, uh, deposition of the sediment is natural. And these processes happen on major creeks and then small creeks as well. The small creek's got another problem though. It's got a head cut right there. And that's gonna continue marching uphill upstream until it hits something hard enough to stop it. Hopefully a rock ledge or something like that. Down in Caldwell County, Clear Fork Creek, there's a golf course right beside the creek. We sometimes get in the way of the creeks trying to manage themselves and be healthy because we mow too close to the creek banks. We spray weeds too close to the creek banks. Sometimes we farm too close to the creek banks. In this case, there are no major trees between the golf course grounds and the creek. And look at the unstable nature. There's some washouts right here. Johnson grass is not gonna hold the bank. It's not strong enough. It's not supposed to be down there. Here's a green ash right here that's helping. You can even tell a green ash this time of year because of the three prong pitchfork of those branches. And if we lose those trees that are right on the bank, in this case, that's probably been cleared in the background. When this one tree falls in, what's behind it to protect the creek? You might have a few trees, but again, they may wash in. Something like the one on the right, we've got a little more protection. You've got some reserves that can be there to, in case this tree falls in, which it will eventually, they always have. The creeks meander. They don't, they're not in the same place they were 10,000 years ago. They move, they move laterally in response to water and sediment. And here's a fence that's been put up to maybe protect the creek. The banks are still sloughing. But this one tree, and I don't remember if that was a cedar elm or a hackberry, but it's holding quite a bit of the bank. And all of this is sloughing, and eventually that'll go too. And this creek or this fence should have been further back and put in a lot earlier, and it would have helped the creek. Uh, even in a forest in East Texas where you have a lot of trees, we still have erosion happening. And you can see the sand deposit right here, sand's the heaviest of the sand, silt, and clay particles. So when the floodwaters spill out over the creek banks, the sand settles first. And that's what we're seeing. But we still have erosion happening. And this may not be a very pretty photo, but the backstory is a wildfire in 2011 went across this pasture. Ash juniper is top killed by the fire and it doesn't re-sprout. And the landowner didn't like the look of that, so they dozed the dead junipers. They came down along the creek and top, or cut off these trees, but they will sprout back. The hardwoods will root sprout. Ash juniper will not. Now, if you read a Sand County Almanac anytime recently, you, you remember a passage that Otto Leopold said in 1948, when the book was published, that at this time, there is no penalty for having a worn out farm. And we still have no penalty. We're in Texas, it's a free state. We can do this, you know. It, the landowner's thinking that this is the best for his property and granted with those top killed dead junipers, they weren't gonna get any better. They were gonna rot down. 
And the creek is beginning to come back. You can see some young hackberries coming in. We've got switchgrass on either side. So it will get better. It's just a short-term bad look. This creek, though, look at the uh, housing that's coming in. In a Blackland Prairie farm country, rural area. It also has grazing that maybe is not done properly. Grazing on our pastures and prairies is natural. We've always had grazing animals, buffalo and prehistoric buffalo, whatever before that. But we mismanage the grazing a lot of times. And if you look at that, there's, it almost looks like there's been some shredding. Uh, that's overuse of the land. Mowing too close to the creek, spraying weeds. And how many trees are left on the creek bank? This old Bodark over here is not even supposed to be, but maybe 1% of the time down in a riparian area, and there it is. So we can do better. Now we're gonna start our waltz across Texas. So we're down in the uh, Piney Woods. I didn't catch, with, I took this photo several years ago and I did not think to write down what creek this was, but Maiden Cane, uh, very aggressive growth. You probably don't want to transplant this in your backyard because it will take over your backyard. But look at where it grows, the Piney Woods, uh, East Texas, Post Oak Savannah region. Here's the Black Fork Creek near Tyler, Yopon, very common over there in the East Texas area into the Edwards Plateau even. And look at the roots on this tree. And these heavy wooded canopies of bottomland riparian areas, we may not have enough sunlight hitting the ground to grow the, the grasses and the forbs that a lot of creeks, say in the hill country, can grow. But those tree roots are doing the job. They're, they're actually as stable as a grassy, forb-dominated riparian area. One of the workshops we went to last year was down at uh, Galveston County, Marshawn Bio. Uh, I was not familiar with this plant here when we walked down and looked at the creek. If you go to one of these one day creek uh, uh, riparian trainings, we do go out on a creek and walk it and look at the plants. Several of the locals there knew the plant though and told me the name and that's what it turned out to be. Look at where it grows right along the Gulf area. Here's a close up of the the leaves and kind of a scraggly looking native, but it is native. Uh, just east of Galveston, Chambers County, we've got a couple of very adaptive riparian plants, ball cypress. There are the, the trunk and here's the leaves. You can even see some the uh, knees that are growing there. And then southern wild rice, a uh, grass that can get seven, eight, nine feet tall. Um, We'll hear more about it. Here we are in Wharton County, El Campo area, still in the Gulf Prairies, but a little bit inland. Cedar elm, you know, that's a common plant all across North Texas, probably, you know, most of Texas. And there it is all the way down in the Gulf Prairies as well. Ball cypress and dwarf palmetto again, dominating that area. These riparian plants have a job to do, and it's to be down on those riparian areas uh, some of them can take the water 100% of the time. Some of them, like switchgrass, can take the wet, wet areas, and it can take the dry. So in a drought, it can, it can still survive. Whereas, you know, bald cypress would need some water to really help it along. May not want that droughty country. So these riparian plants are there because they can adapt to that, that moisture. The lower Nueces River um, widens out quite a bit. It's pretty, it's uh, got a lot of white rock down around the um, Uvalde area, but down here, when it gets closer to the Gulf, you don't see the white rock as much. Still quite a bit of diversity of vegetation. And I'm gonna introduce, David talked about plant communities and, and I'm not sure if we're talking the same definition or not, but we're gonna introduce plant communities to you as well. Um, now we're in the post oak savanna, the area between the piney woods and the blackland prairie. But notice this plant, river birch, also occurs in the piney woods. Uh, very unique with that peeling bark. Very easy to spot it from a distance. The leaves have got very, very deeply notched 
teeth, like an old crosscut saw. And there's a saying that you can't see uh, the forest for the trees. But if you look in the forest, you can see that tree right there is River Birch. So you gotta look close sometimes. Here we are still in the post oak savanna on a little creek in Limestone County and the Southern wild rice. Does it, do you think that plant's telling you that it likes to be in the water? By where it's growing, it's saying I can take the water. Here's a very similar looking plant to it called rice cut grass. And both of these will cut your fingers if you slide your fingers down the, the leaf stem. Um, this one on the right only gets about half the height of the southern wild rice. Um, but look, look at the overlap that they have. They, they both occur in some of the same counties, same regions. Um, both of them grow right out in the water. And if you go down toward the uh, mission areas in San Antonio, we had a workshop down there last year. Uh, this Espada Dam was completed in uh, 1745, I believe. Uh, crude construction, I'm sure, back then, but it is holding, you know, nearly 300 years, and it's still there. What I want to call you, and it's the purpose of it was to divert some of the water from the San Antonio River into uh, farmland and for irrigation through drain, uh, irrigation ditches some of the uh, farmland supporting those missions. Now, this grass right here is what we want to look at. So now we're going to go and get right up on top of the dam and look back down, and here is rice cut grass. Look at all that energy that it's absorbing. And it says, okay, bring it on. I can take it. It's a good grass. Here's the seed head right here, kind of like a big Johnson grass looking plant, but it is extremely adapted to being in these wet environments. Here's where we're again mentioning the plant communities, a small creek up in the rolling plains, Miller's Creek. Look at the different plants. Individually, these plants may not have the strength to support the banks and, and keep erosion at a minimum. But when you can put different plants like this together as a community, now they have the strength to support that bank. So we look for diversity of plants, but they need to be diverse plants that are riparian, not just upland plants, because the upland plants can't stand that erosion. They can't, maybe they can't even stand the water. They can't stand to be inundated, the roots, but good plant communities are what we look for on our creeks. Do you think this Edwards Plateau Creek is eroding at excessive rates? It's got a very stable plant community. Now I saw water willow in one of David's slides. Here's a creek up in the Blackland Prairie, Northern Blackland Prairie, Wilson Creek, Collin County, Northeast of Dallas. Uh, this is one of the creeks that will have wild rye, Canada wild rye, Virginia wild rye. It will not have a lot of summertime um, forbs and grasses because there's too much shade. But that list of plants at the bottom is what we saw out there, and it's a stable creek. It's just as stable as any other creek that has good vegetation of the more herbaceous nature. Salado Creek, if you're going back north through uh, on the interstate, stop in and look at Salado Creek, a beautiful creek. Um, it's in the Blackland Prairie, but it looks like a hill country creek. Look at the plant diversity that's on Salado Creek. One of the bad things though, it's in town in the village of Salado and a lot of the landowners mow right up against it. So that's a, that's a problem. But this creek uh, floods pretty, pretty regularly and it will uh, rearrange itself. And floods bring in nutrients, they bring in plant parts. And another attribute of these riparian plants is they can root from just a broken piece. So when you have a flood and the plants get broken apart and they go down and land on some fresh mud, sediment, gravel bar, they can start growing again. So that's, that's one difference against the uh, upland varieties of these plants. Now, this is a, uh, a ranch that there was a spring that they got their water a hundred and something years ago from, and we were walking toward the headwaters of this spring to take a look at it. 
And I want you to focus on that white tail fawn because it's in focus. That's what I was taking, trying to get a photo of, but the elderberry behind that fawn is out of focus. So, but that's what elderberry looks like when it's in flower. It definitely likes to be in the riparian areas. Strongly rhizometrous spreads and hope. Look at those roots, even on a young plant like that, holding that soil. Salado Creek doesn't always flow water. Sometimes it goes underground, but you can see at some point during a recent flood event, the water level was right there because it deposited the, the fruits of sycamore and that's where they germinated and came up. And sycamore, southern half of the state, a few counties up in the northern uh, part of the state. And sometimes sycamore seeds will germinate in a boulder like this. Now they're not gonna survive, but that just shows you how tenacious they are about wanting to germinate and grow. Here's the plant, big trees, the leaves, the berries, or the fruits. And again, pretty widespread over the eastern two thirds of the state. Now, here's a creek, the headwaters of the Lampasas River in Lampasas County. Um, this property was owned by a widow. Her husband passed away 20 years or so earlier. It had been leased out for 20 years, had been overgrazed for a hundred and something years. Um, this probably has 140 years of sheep, goat, cattle, native white-tailed deer, not, not many exotics at all in Lampasas County, free ranging anyway, but look at the grazing. It's uniformly short. Um, I want to call your attention to be looking, that rock will be in the next photo and look at this bank right here, it's sloughing. Uh, now, what changed to this photo six years later is they enrolled this into a program called the Riparian Buffer Program that's administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they pay the landowner to fence off, and they pay for the most of the cost of the fencing, fence off the creek, or if you just want to get rid of the cows for 10 years, you, you don't have to fence the creek off, just pr protect the whole property. Um, it's kind of like CRP was, Conservation Reserve Program land for cropland, except this is for the creeks. So the that kind of a sloughing bank is stabilized. The water's still flowing. It's, it's just harder to see because of the vegetation. But six years later, what's missing in that photo in May? What should be there? Wildflowers. Sheep, and goats, deer, they eat a lot of wildflowers. So sometimes we, we need to do restoration work if we want to, if we really want to jumpstart this recovery. Uh, just deferring it from grazing, and this did not prevent the deer from getting in there because they could jump the fence, but it did keep the sheep and cattle out. Here we are on the Bosque River, Bosque County. Uh, three very popular riparian plants, water willow. This is a native that you should have in your backyard water garden. You have to be careful when you buy water plants because most of them are exotic. But this is a native. Water primrose, emery sedge. Here's a close up of the water willow. It spreads with underground rhizomes. Beautiful flowers. Pollinators love to visit. Look at where it grows right in the middle part of the state. Now, water primrose undergoes a transition in its leaf structure throughout the summer. Early in the spring, when it first starts growing, Look at those leaves, they're spoon shaped, rounded. Later, about midsummer, those leaves become pointed and they look like Maximilian sunflower leaves. They've got a keel, a, a V shape. So, this is water primrose. There's also one you'll see on the creeks called tall water primrose, but notice the petals. We're, we're one short with tall water primrose compared to the water primrose. And again, South and East Texas is where they're most commonly found. Here's kind of a rare sight, if you, unless you're looking at creeks in May when uh, emery sedge is making seed. It produces seed very early. This is not a grass, it is a sedge. Uh, the counties that it shows up in, uh, I think it's more common than what it shows. And these distribution maps 
come from herbarium pages that are on file with herbariums across the state, private and university and, you know, herbariums. And it may be that just no one came right there or right here and looked for her uh, emery sage because it's it's more common. But that's that's what we use. And if you see that there's a uh, maybe that spot right there, even though it doesn't show up because it's circled on three sides, there's probably emery sage there. So you can use this as as a good idea that you're probably going to have this plant in your county if, if you see it all around you. Now, here we are on the Brazos River, Palapeno County, a little over a mile below Possum Kingdom Lake Dam. That bridge there was built in the 1930s by the Works Progress Administration, kind of like the old CCC camp days. They built a good bridge because it had stayed. And that patch of Emory Sedge, I, I put a couple of arrows there at different points. So I want you to pick a point. You might pick this point out here. We're gonna look at it as we go forward. Um, this was in May of 2008. Our next photo is November of 2008. Your point still there? Let's go back and look. Yep. Went forward too far. All right. Now I'm going the wrong way. I'm going way too far. Let's see if I can back this up. Okay, so now we're going to go back and go forward. There's six months later, and then I showed it to you quickly there, but what happened in between May and November was a major flood. Well, I'm still going wrong. All right, right there. There's our flood. And the uh, flood... They had to open eight of the nine gates on Possum Kingdom Dam. The, eight, the ninth one wouldn't drop. And water was flowing that depth for almost six weeks. And look at the arches on the bridge. Water, water would have been up about here. So there was five feet of water flowing over it. And some of the floods are so severe that they have to close this road down. And there'll be that old white froth It'll, it'll water will be over the bridge, and then when the water recedes, that old frothy stuff will be there still for weeks. Um, so there it is again after the flood. I went back in 2016, took another photo, and what what happened? If you remember in 2015, Blanco flood, 2016, uh, up in North Texas, those were years when we had 40 inches of rainfall each year. Um, look at what's happened, if I can go back without, oops. Look at the switchgrass right up here. And there, right here, you can see a little bit of switchgrass starting to show up. This is almost fall and there's the switchgrass right there. And if we go to 2016, this is after that two years of heavy flooding. It stripped a lot of that grass away and it stripped some of the uh, emery sedge away, but the switchgrass is coming in to help take its place maybe or to stabilize it. Uh, the plant community works together. Here it is in 2019. So it's, it's lost some, you know, this was deposited some time ago and it's gonna move it but it stayed for 10 or 11 years. So riparian vegetation is very stable. We need it. And when you have good vegetation, your creeks can look like this. The banks will be good. There won't be any uh, sloughing or sawtooth edges on the creek, which shows instability. Uh, a friend of mine, Steve Nelly, sent these photos of the South Texas Plains. And he said, one of the biggest problems down there is it's just so wooded so, you know, brushy country, you can't see the creek very well. So that's an example of this photo. But then it opens up in some places and you start to see certain plants again. There's water willow, keeps showing up. Bushy blue stem, very easy to spot because it turns red during the winter. It'll bushed out top. And if you're, in, if you're in the uplands, away from the creek, driving around and you happen to see some bushy blue stem, don't drive to it because it's going to be growing in a seepy area. 
there's a perch water table there, clay layer, rock layer, and there's water there that's going to bog you down because it only grows where it's seepy. Here is a gulf cord grass. Now, this can get head tall. This is early. You see the trees haven't leafed out yet. So this is early in the year. Um, pretty much coastal prairie, South Texas plains plant. Excellent grazing plant for cattle. This is my favorite stretch of the, any creek in Texas, Honey Creek in Lano County. I think if I remember when David was talking, I, I, it came to me that I think this ranch is now under a conservation easement. Um, look at the plant diversity here. Water willow shows up again, switchgrass, sycamore, bog hemp, spike rush, water pennywort, maidenhair fern, a beautiful creek, flows water year round. Um, kind of a funny story about this plant right here. Notice the water willow is completely underwater. It's partially dislodged from where it was rooted and growing. And we had, we're going to have a workshop the next day out there. And I've, after we got everything set up, we got the tables and chairs and everything set up. I was going to go down and walk the creek, put my rubber boots on, knee boots, got out in the creek and walking, taking pictures. And across the creek, a little further from me to y'all, I saw this. And I looked down and I'm about an inch away from going over the top of the boots. And it was water was going to get deeper. And I was traveling light that day. Just going to be one night out. I had one pair of jeans. I didn't want to get them wet or muddy. So I did not go and pull this out of the water. And I regretted it several times. So I just took a picture, and then this is a cropped image. But look at the roots, all of the, uh, all of the roots right there of that plant. There are miles and miles in a cubic foot of some of these plants that have specially special riparian uh, adaptations. Look at where water will is growing, the middle third of the state. Again, a great riparian plant for your backyard water garden. South Lano River, south of Junction, has got issues with axis deer. This is not grazed by livestock right here. Strictly white-tailed deer and axis deer, free-ranging axis deer. Now, the, tr the trees, that bank on the far side is a cut bank. Notice gravel bar, gravel bar on this side. The, you can look at an aerial photo and tell what which way the water flows in a creek by looking at the down timber because the, the trees, the root wad acts like an anchor and holds, it gets lodged somewhere in the creek. The top swims around, points downstream. So the root wad points upstream, top of the tree points downstream. But you, you know, here's one that's fallen in, there's one that's fallen, here's one that's still green recently fallen in, but there's not a lot of support right there in the vegetation because of excessive grazing. On that gravel bar though was this plant, which is probably the winner of the I can stand the floods because gravel bar brickle bush, it's only about a foot tall and eight inches or so of sediment was washed away in a recent flood. But look at it standing there with all its cohorts, just green and growing waiting on the next time a heavy flood brings sediment back to it. So gravel bar brickle bush, small area of the state where it grows in, and Kimball, Kimball County is right, right in here. So it's not one of the counties shown, but it's, it's there. Comal Springs, Edwards Plateau, vegetational area. Um, right here in the photo are the two of the grasses that you can buy the seeds for if you wanna to try to help a creek and do something to maybe bring some more stability, you can buy the seed of eastern gamma grass and switchgrass. Now, the switchgrass variety that you want to ask for is Alamo. It's a bottomland switchgrass. There's also a variety called Blackwell, named after the town in Nolan County, but it's an upland switchgrass. So if you want, when you order your seed, just make sure you get Alamo switchgrass, and if you want the Eastern Gamma grass, you, you just order it. There's no variety for it. Um, there have been some small samples done. There's a San Marcos variety of Eastern Gamma, but it's not commercially available. 
Um, but look at the distribution of switchgrass. Anywhere you are in the state, you can grow switchgrass. Um, pretty well, most places you can grow Eastern Gamma, but it, Eastern Gamma and switch can take the wet and the dry. So they can go where it's wet. If the creek dries up and we have another drought like 2011, doesn't matter to these grasses, they can still adapt to the drying. We'll go up into the rolling plains. Here's the, uh, the part of the state that has the longest names of creeks. <laughs> Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red, uh, Salt Fork of the Red River, um, and all of the creeks in the Panhandle and the rolling plains are red because of the soils. And you see the salt cedar growing out there in the middle. Notice the color distribution now is blue because that's an introduced plant and invasive plant. Now this is also in uh, Rolling Plains, Oxbow Creek. What's an oxbow? It's a piece of a creek that's been dis uh, cut off and it makes an oxbow lake. Well, look at the, uh, the route of this creek. It's certainly an oxbow too. And this little white stuff right down here is gypsum. Uh, it's hollow right there. So if you walk out on some of this white stuff that's at the surface and it sounds a little hollow, that's because it is. So you may want to step off of it. Jim Ned Creek in the Southern Rolling Plains, a very stable creek. Look at the diversity of riparian plants. All of these, uh, we have a scoring system of a score of one being a plant that's no better than bare ground to 10 being a plant that's equal to rooted uh, uh, anchored rock or anchored logs. So switchgrass scores a nine, emery sedge a nine, water willow a nine, and button bush a nine. As a community, they're a 10. So these are very strong, stable plants. Here's a close up of the button bush. It doesn't get much taller than head tall. Right in that photo right there, though, there's probably uh, 50 to 100 stems coming out of the ground. So it can just bend over when the floods come. Look at where it grows, pretty widely available across most of the state. Good pollinator plant. Uh, a unique characteristic, sometimes you'll see uh, where there's a, a node, there'll be a pair of leaves. Sometimes there's three leaves and sometimes there's four. And we've seen, you can pull a stem out of, right here and it's got three leaves. Look over here and here's a stem with four leaves. Just a unique little trait. And a couple of years ago when COVID first started, some of the kids, when we introduced this plant at the Buckskin Brigade, they said, well, we're gonna call that COVID plant. Here's another uh, clear fork of the Brazos River. Although the clear fork does not run clear. Maybe it did a hundred and something years ago, but it's well protected in this, on this ranch with switchgrass and just a little bit of water well is showing up down here. But the switchgrass again, grows pretty well statewide. Not grass, K-N-O-T, not grass. Look at those runners, those stolons running down across that rock. They're also rooting right here in the sand, trying to hold that, that little bit of uh, sediment. Look at where it grows, pretty well everywhere. Uh, here is knot grass growing in conjunction with frog fruit. Each each one of them trying to outdistance the other. Yeah. And frog fruit, pretty well grow wherever you want it to grow. Red River between Texas and Oklahoma, a very flashy river. You know, um, there are places where a ranch maybe has lost twenty acres of riverfront in one flood. And next year they've gained 50 acres because of the way it's eroding and it's, it's meandering, the deposition. Common reed here, more, more common in the Panhandle, but it did make it down to the Vernon area. Now this photo, Steve sent me this photo as well. And at first he said, um, he said, I think this is Transpacus. And then he went and looked where he actually got the photo from uh, and he said, no, I took this photo in Terrell, and Terrell is right there. So that's actually the far western Edwards Plateau. But look at the vegetation in the background. It's beginning to look like Transpacus. So 
And Steve said that it's west of the Pecos, so most of the locals consider that the Trans-Pecos. But seep willow backers is a little bit more rare version of the common willow backers that we see across most of the state. See in yellow now, that means it's present and rare in the state. And there's bushy blue stem again. Madeira Creek, we toured this last fall as part of the fall symposium of the Native Plant Society, Fort Davis area, uh, seep willow backers in flower then. And I didn't write down any other plant names, I'm not real familiar with them out there. And I took this photo mainly to show, look at the hog damage, even a mile up yeah. in the Davis Mountains. This is also Nature Conservancy land right here. Uh, down in uh, below Marfa, Presidio County, Sanigua Creek. This was a wintertime shot taken during quail season. Um, this ranch is proud of their creek, though. They even put a sign up. Not for the public to see, right on the creek inside the middle of the ranch. But it's a nice sign, and if, you're, if your creek only gets about 11 inches of rainfall a year, that's something to be proud of. That creek does look good. So now, here's Hordes Creek, Coleman County, diverse plant communities of appropriate riparian vegetation. It's got to be the riparian stuff. With good management, will provide healthy riparian areas. Just like on Blanco Creek, they did some restoration work. This, the damage was so severe that they had to do some. And that's often used to jumpstart recovery. And here's a little creek in Burnett County. That Texas flag was there when we stopped to take this picture. And here we are today, 187 years ago, the third day of the Battle of the Alamo. They were fighting for Texas freedoms. And we need to be Texans that take care of our creeks, protect them, keep them healthy. And that's what I want to leave you with. We have time, we'll take some questions. Any questions? Yes. Have the Texas creeks ever had a history of having fever on them? Have what creeks? Any of the creeks in Texas with fever. The question is, have any of the creeks in Texas had beaver on them? And yes, a lot of them. Um, the, the beavers in um, the Blackland Prairie burrow into the banks. They don't build the uh, mounds. And then we'll have creeks that have uh, low water, small mounds, small dams. But yes, they're here. They've been trapped out years ago. But in fact, where creeks are uh, nurtured and brought back to health, the beaver return too, because the creek remains stable and perennial. So they do reply, respond. Well, the question is, are cattails good in creeks? They're, they're native, but they're not usually common in creeks that have flowing water. They're, they're more commonly seen where you have stagnant water. So the water's dammed up somewhat and it doesn't flow and cattails can grow there. Uh, they can get to be too thick. They can be. Question all the way in the back. Yes. All right. The question is: Could Alamo switchgrass become invasive? Um, it again, it's a native, and we we do have natives that become. I hate to use the word invasive, more like aggressive, um, but it all depends on what you want. Those pictures of the clear fork of the Brazos that had the switchgrass on both sides, that's what most people would love to see. And it becomes, in that case, a um, single species stand right there, but behind it, there's black willow, mesquite, and others. So there's additional plants, but if it's not grazed, it can become, it, it will spread. But again, I do support and promote grazing because grazing management, uh, this little picture right here, 
you're looking at a small creek. Uh, sometimes we think of it as a band of green on either side of the water that separates the water from the uplands. But we, we should think of these, this band of green as a band of gold because that's what it's really, that's the value of it. You know, most people love their creeks and they want to take care of them. So it'd be hard to have too much switchgrass, I would think. Yes. Okay, if you've got a creek in your yard, what can you do to strengthen it and should you mow it at all? You should designate an area, and this is what a lot of the towns are doing, they have a non-mow zone. So they'll only mow maybe no more than 50 feet from the creek, I mean, away from the creek. So you'd wanna leave an area that's non-mowed because if it's, if the vegetation like, um, the bushy blue stem or switchgrass that's, uh, well, sw switchgrass that's five, six feet tall. If you mow it down to this, that's the most extreme form of overgrazing in effect that that grass will ever see. So you don't wanna mow it that short. You need to mow it tall and it's hard to mow tall. So it's better to leave it alone. And if you wanna mow a, a very narrow angle, like the width of this aisle to where you can get down to the creek, that's okay. okay. But you're leaving 99% of the creek unmown and safe. So it'd be better to leave it uh, leave it alone. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The uh, the question can besides water willow, American uh, elderberry and button bush, could they survive a dry spell? A month is nothing. Um uh, Six months is getting to be a short drought and a year or more becomes more of a problem. But um, button bush is considered an obligate, which 99% of the time it's gonna be near the water with wet roots. Um, water willows an obligate as well. Uh, what was the other one we were talking about? Elderberry. I think it's a facultative wet, which is a, can stand a little more drying. Um, but most of these are adaptive and they will survive. They may top kill back and they'll root sprout. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry so much. Uh, questions around the community. Uh, number one, how have you driven infected creeks in Texas? How has Nutria impacted the creeks of Texas? They do a lot of damage. But like uh, Axis deer and other exotics, they are highly affected by rapid application of lead. <laughs> so they can be controlled. You have to get those at night, though, mostly. Um, they, they're not helping. They're not helping. Okay, that's a good question. What What's practical for a cut bank 20 feet tall in the Blackland Prairie? It's going to continue. Um, that vertical bank, nothing grows on it. And so it's going to continue widening until it eventually, instead of vertical, it begins to lay over like this. And now vegetation can grow. So it's not much you can do. It's going to get nasty looking. It's going to continue to widen. That cut bank will continue. Uh, you just have to wait. That wouldn't be the time to put the switchgrass seed out. You've got to wait until it starts laying over like that. When it lays over, now um, sediment gets deposited, and that's bringing nutrients and bringing those broken plant parts and seeds down, and it will begin to heal over. That's a If that cut bank is... 50 feet away from your house, it's a sure concern, but it's a problem that has to, uh, you have to live with. What, I'm not sure I understand the plant. What? Oh, okay. Uh, scouring rush. Yeah. Well, it's common on some of the creeks. I've seen it on the uh, Red River in Cook County and in Parker County, we Weatherford on creeks. But it's not, not real common. Uh, it does a good job of holding the vegetation, but it's, I don't think it's as strong rooted as some of the others, but normally it, because it grows so 
congested, you know, to get so close together, it, it builds its own stability. And on that uh, creek section of the San Antonio River where that Espada Dam was, there was some of it growing right there, San Antonio County. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, no, where are you going? Okay, Willow, Willow Barris is taking over her creek in uh, Bandera County. Willow Bacris in a riparian area, and it's a native, uh, it's a good thing because it's putting root down and holding the soil in the absence of some of the other plants that might, could be there. So we, we tolerate it in the riparian areas. If it's on the uplands, up where the pasture grasses are, take it out because it's not doing anything but taking moisture. But down in the riparian areas, it has a job. Yes. Uh, we've done workshops where we did one on the DFW airport grounds one year uh, where they have a lot of concrete line ditches and they mow right up to the edge of them. And, and we were trying to, it's an educational thing. You've got to just plant seeds in the minds of those managers that are doing that kind of work that uh, less mowing is sometimes a better thing. But the, the person also that we've got to get in touch with is the one riding that mower because they're the last ones to see those plants. And I guarantee you more of those guys and gals have been chewed out for leaving too much vegetation than they ever have for taking too much. So they err on the side of my job's to mow, so I'm going to mow it. So it's, it's an educational process. Yes. Well, the question is like the Corps of Engineer and even the cities, I would say, are they doing anything to go more natural in the restoration? This riparian management is a new endeavor. Only been in Texas about 25 years, there's educational process. So it's a slow process to change. If you go to a lot of the urban areas, they want to manage floods by getting the water quote, through as quick as they can. Instead of what we're promoting is you want to slow the water down, allow it to soak in. So it's a, it's a learning process that has to, has to really start in the universities because the engineers are taught, this is how you handle flood water, get, get it through your town dig that ditch and concrete it and get that water on through. That's not the correct way. Okay. I was still in here by training and, and in the past you were taught about the concrete ditch. That's become very outdated and it's much more likely you're going to put in vegetation now for the drainage ditches um, in Lockman City and everyone would be going to more peace. So it's an education process, but that's again another thing where chapters can say, hey, are you aware of this? Yeah. And most city leaders, I think, want to do what's best for the environment. Um, they just don't have the time or energy to investigate. So we have to be their researchers and educators for them. So, you know, up in the Metroplex, They've had houses that flooded because water was backing up. So many more subdivisions were built. So much more water's coming through. It floods areas that 30 years ago didn't flood. And so they have actually bought, the city has bought some of those houses and took away everything but the slab and left it as a natural area. And we may have to do that more in the future. Um, if, if a flood gets in your house, that's a bad thing. But is your house too low in the elevation? That's another question. But those houses that are getting flooded now, they used to not flood. So uh, riparian areas are a big thing that we need to work with. Again, they only amount to one to 3%. If you own a thousand acres, uh, only one to 3% of it is likely to be riparian. So again, it's a very small amount that we need to manage at the utmost care and respect. We have time? One more. All right, we got two hands, so let's go to. Um, you, you could ask, go into the Farm Service Agency of the USDA office in every county, and it's called, uh, there was two, CP22 Riparian Buffer Program and CP Conservation Practice 29 Herbaceous 
wildlife buffer and see if they, those programs, when I retired, they were still available. It was on a year long sign up. You could, you didn't have to wait for a sign up. You could sign up at any time. And NRCS gets involved. We go out and do the field work and the FSA handles the, the payment process. Yes, ma'am. All right, a seasonal creek. We've got three types of creeks in Texas, the perennial that flow year round, seasonal or intermittent that flow part of the year, usually during the winter when the trees are dormant and there's nothing you're really using that water. And then ephemeral creeks that only flow as a result of rain or snow melt. So the creeks that have contact with the water table underneath are the perennial and the seasonal. So those are the ones that the plants that we're talking about and we saw the pictures of should be present. Um, but a seasonal creek is just going to have water part of the year. There's not much you can change there. You just want good, healthy vegetation. Uh, it doesn't all have to be the, the water willow. It can be switchgrass and eastern gamma because you, you need plants that can take some dry country, dry, dry weather, as well as the wet times. All right. Thank you all very much. Ricky is amazing, I think. He knows so much about this, and we're so pleased to have him.